It was the very last game of the 1958 season in Minneapolis. And during the course of the ball game, uh, Maurice went over the back of a player and lost his balance and landed on his head and was knocked out. He regained consciousness, went back and played the game. And, uh, you know, it was just unusual. After the game, we were going to catch a plane. He had his arm around myself and around Dick Ricketts, and he kind of collapsed, saying that, hey, I need, need some help here. Something is wrong with me. Something is terribly wrong with me. Heading back to Cincinnati, I mean, he just got deathly sick. He, 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 he got white, you know, he, he sweated profusely. I'll never forget, it was as if somebody grabbed him by the head and dunked him in a swimming pool. He was absolutely soaked. He was unconscious, and we were all very nervous. We had an ambulance waiting for him, and they rushed him to St. Elizabeth Hospital, which was 10 minutes from the airport. He was out for about a day and woke up totally paralyzed. How would you like to be one of the premier athletes in the world on Saturday, on the plane trip back to Cincinnati on Sunday, go into a coma and wake up totally paralyzed except for the use of his eyes and his brain? I mean, can you imagine anything worse? The royal season was over and Maurice was now alone, fighting for his life. We played the last game. Everybody had their suitcases packed. So I was the only Cincinnatian uh, that made my home in Cincinnati. So here was a guy without a team, without uh, teammates, his family in Pittsburgh. He was a man in limbo. I was the only one there. Jack Twyman was just starting a professional career and a family just 23 years old, he would be faced with a difficult decision. He came in to the house and, and said that, you know, we have this situation and, um, you know, Maurice is going to need, um, you know, some support here in Cincinnati. He was confined to a hospital and uh, some bills had to be paid and uh, the only way I could make some decisions I, I just couldn't be a teammate. I had to have some legal authority, and uh, in order to do so, uh, uh, I was made uh, his legal guardian. I mean, that's what friends are for. There was really no question as to if we would do it or not. It was just something that we both felt that we had to do and, and wanted to do. What Jack did was unheard of. Uh, especially in those times with all, all, all the racial problems going on around our country, to take over uh, for an African-American who, who had no one, really. He was in a hospital. Someone had to take over and do everything for him. He didn't have to do it, but he did. Maurice now had a friend to watch over him as he fought to get better. Never, ever have I heard him say, why me? Never has he been depressed. Never. Have I heard him be angry? Absolutely dedicated to, uh, okay, I'm in this situation, let's go. He'd come up from therapy soaking wet, from working so hard. And whatever he did, he attacked with a viciousness that, uh, and, and that's what was amazing. He never believed that he was trapped. And he was gonna, one way or the other, lick this thing that he was stuck with. I was able to go home to my family and I was able to live a normal life and, and I'm saying to myself, wow, you know, look at that guy. The years went by. Jack Twyman was a perennial all-star and Maurice continued to work as the bond between Maurice and the Twymans grew stronger. He loved to talk about politics. He loved to talk about current events. He loved to talk about the books you were reading, and it was just always such a stimulating time with him. 
he treated us like family and, and we treated him the same way. I can remember I had a bad game or I was depressed and I would selfishly figure out a way to go see Maurice because I know when I left him, he would pick me up. And uh, that's the way he was. In June of 1969, more than a decade since Maurice's accident, he would receive an honor from the school he had given so much to many years before. They called me from St. Francis and said, we're building this wonderful new gymnasium and we want to name it the Maurice Stokes Fieldhouse. Can we come out? And well, we arranged a little dinner at our house and uh, it was in honor of his birthday, but you know he didn't have any idea. With your birthday coming up this weekend, it's about the only weekend that uh, you're getting older and wiser. And and so he thought this would be a nice evening to just have a quiet, have a few pops and not talk about, I don't remember having any birthdays. And you start, you stop thinking after 75, right? He was in one corner of our family room and in the wheelchair and he was talking to somebody and in walks the president and the athletic director of St. Francis. <laughs> How are you? Huh? Looking good, boy. Huh? And Father Vince came up to him and said, we're here to ask your permission to name the field house, the Marie Stokes field house. Would you be willing to have uh, our new field house named after you? <clears throat> we think the best name we could give it would be your name, the Stokes field house. Well, he lost it. He just couldn't believe it. I mean, he was so touched. Maurice would never get to see the building that would bear his name. As 10 months later, his long struggle would come to an end. Jack called because he was, uh, he was away playing a game and said, I, I really want you to go over to the hospital because Maurice is very ill. I went to the hospital and Maurice was in a pretty dire situation at that time. There were a lot of doctors and nurses working with him. Maurice saw me out in the hall and um, he recognized me and, you know, wanted to talk, but but we couldn't, and, and then that was the end. So, that was uh, my last uh, visit with Maurice. When I arrived at the hospital, he had already passed away, but they didn't move him to the, till I got there and I was able to you know, spend a minute or two by myself, but he had already passed. I mean, his heart just gave out. Stokes' life lasted just 36 years. But his story continues to inspire others. One year at Good Samaritan Hospital, they had a kid, five, six years old, and either broke his back or severed his spine. This kid wanted to die. He was never going to walk again. They sent him to see Maurice. Now fast forward about 15 years. I was asked to give a speech at Purcell High School here in Cincinnati to the graduating class. And, <laughs> and after the speech, the principal said, we've got a surprise for you. And this poor kid on crutches walked out from behind the curtain. And it was this kid who was graduating from high school. And that's typical of what Maurice was all about. There are, you know, special people in your life who have passed on, who have died. But there are just a few who you think about all the time. And Maurice is one of, one of them. I think we 
benefited much more from being associated with Maurice than Maurice benefited by being associated with me. You learn pretty quickly what's important and what isn't important. And as far as I'm concerned, that's Maurice's legacy to the Twyman family. Uh, he uh, taught us a lot. We learned a lot from him. And uh, we're honored to have had the opportunity to be associated with him.